bless us this morning as we study 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. These are based on John C. Maxwell's book and a lecture taken uh, out of his book, uh, These um, 21 Irrefutable Laws, and put into the context of Bible and testimonies. Um, he is a well-known lecturer and author and pastor, and wherever he goes, people learn things uh, that they wish they had known a long time before. Some have said, why didn't you teach me these things 20 years ago? And he says, I didn't know them. So this was a recent development in his um, uh, experience where he put together a whole lifetime of learning on leadership into these 21 irrefutable laws. Now, some might uh, criticize the use of an author besides, you know, an Adventist author. Uh, he is not an Adventist, but he has put out in very concrete terms some very important principles which, if we follow, we will improve our own lives and the lives of others around us. Now, as you will see, these things that he presents um, actually are found in Scripture and are also confirmed in Spirit of Prophecy. We read in a letter of 1907, God has never authorized any man to exercise a ruling power over fellow workers. And those who are allowed to dictate spirit, a dictatorial spirit to come into their official work, need to experience the converting power of God upon their hearts. They have placed man where God should be. So what is leadership here in this context? It is not a dictatorial demanding spirit. It is putting God in the place where he belongs. Now, when we look at leadership, the first law that is mentioned here is, as Maxwell calls, the law of the lid. And uh, this is very well described in uh, a testimony which we will read in a moment, but uh, leadership determines a person's level of effectiveness. So if you want to know your level of effectiveness and what it's going to be is how well that you are practicing the laws of leadership. How we can say all of us are practicing that law. Whatever you will accomplish is restricted by your ability to lead others. For example, if your leadership could be rated as an 8, then your effectiveness can never be greater than a 7. If your leadership is only a 4, then your effectiveness will never be higher than a 3. Your leadership ability, for better or for worse, always determines your effectiveness and the potential impact on your organization. So if you could rate leadership from a 1 to 10, he's saying, if you're a 4, you're not going to be able to lead others um, to a higher level than a 3. If you're an 8, you can't lead them higher than a 7. And this is true when you're recruiting people, when you're drawing people to yourself, uh, to, by the truth, if you are... Um, at a certain level of maturity, you're never going to reach people higher than your level of maturity, or very rarely. So it depends on your uh, maturity level, your leadership level, and your spiritual level, how deeply converted you are on what kind of person you are going to be leading or bringing into the truth as well. So the law of the lid simply states that people will sel seldom rise higher than their minister or their Bible teacher. Converts will seek to rise no higher than their preacher. And this is Testimonies Volume 2 and Testimonies Volume 1. So this is the law of the lid. The standard is be ye therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven which is perfect. God calls upon men and women to empty their hearts of self 
then his spirit can find unobstructed interest. Stop trying to do the work yourself. Ask God to work in and through you until the words of the apostle become yours. I live, yet not I live, but Christ liveth in me. Manuscript releases, volume 1, pages 366, 367. So what is this law of the lid? This law of the lid states that whatever level you have reached to, you cannot expect others to reach a higher level. I remember when I was in uh, military, in ROTC, they told us a story that there were two companies. One never excelled, and the other one always did. And as they looked on the field of practice, one sergeant, drill sergeant, would stand or sit alongside of his uh, marching men as they marched around the field, and he would yell commands at them. And these men never excelled in their um, drill exercise. But there was another sergeant who had another platoon, and he always marched with his men. He always marched beside them, doing exactly what he told them to do. And that drill team always excelled. And so when uh, I told you before about uh, being the leader of a drill team, I practiced that also and when, when I was in uh, ROTC. And I can thank the Lord from that example uh, also taught me uh, how to help others by seeking to be what we're trying to demonstrate. So the law of the lid is related to the next law, and that's the law of influence. The law of influence merely says the true measure of leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. So if you try to be a leader and you're not using um, influence as your currency, the currency of leadership is your influence. And how do we measure influence? Well, the, uh, that's a hard thing to say, but what we, what we know about influence is that when we take care of what we can do, then our influence grows. If we're worried about what other people are doing or not doing and seeking to uh, make them do things by criticism or whatever, then our influence will diminish. If you don't have influence, you will never be able to lead others. What is influence based upon? Well, Harry Overstreet said, the very essence of all power to influence lies in getting other persons to participate. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get people to participate. And we have a lot of news about people in uh, different situations. And, of course, following fashion is one of those. People follow fashion, that's a participation. We have gangs who get, come together as a collective groups and they actually provide a family to people who have lost their family and there's a great deal of loyalty within these uh, structures. And so we get people to participate in different levels and different kinds of, um, of activities through our influence. Well, if no one is following, you're not a leader. The law influ influence is about obtaining followers, which is the basis of leadership. So when you're thinking about how your uh, effectiveness is, if you're not able to influence others, if there's something about your character or the way that you're dealing with people that causes them to be um, put off, to be repelled in some way, for some reason, then you're losing influence. And we'll talk more about credibility and conversion and those kinds of things which measure, which have to do with your influence. So influence is the currency of leadership. And that influence is based upon trust. So the law of influence, um, we have many people who think that management and leadership are the same thing. 
but they're not. Leadership and management are two different things. Leadership is about influencing people to follow, while management is focused on maintaining systems and processes. As former chairman and CEO Lee Iacocca of Chrysler said, sometimes even the best manager is like a little boy with a dog waiting to see where the dog wants to go so he can take him there. Is that the kind of leadership you want? You want to be. You want to find out where the people want to go and then take them there. If you look in the political process today, why is polling so important to, uh, to politicians? Because they want to know what the people want so they can say what the people want to hear so they can get voted into office. Is that leadership? Not in my opinion. And not in the opinion of uh, our presentation here. Leadership is knowing the direction you need to go and influencing people to follow you. It's having a vision and getting people to go in that direction. So the law of influence. What is the best way for us to use this law of influence? The best way to test whether a person can lead rather than just manage is to ask him to create positive change. One of the ways then it says the best way is to create positive change. What do you think that means, positive change? What is positive change? There's negative change, there's positive change. Something that's beneficial, something that is helpful, something that creates order out of chaos. I know you've been talking a little bit about that, order out of chaos, because we've been studying the bottomless pit the great abyss. Uh, God brings order out of chaos. The first law of the universe, Sister White says, in um, volume 6, page 200, I believe it is, is that is the law of order. So we need to create positive change, and one of the positive things we can do is to bring in order, bring in uh, direction. So managers can maintain direction, but they can't change it. To move people in a new direction, you need influence. So how do you have influence with people? How can you have influence by, with people? What do you think? By gaining their trust. By gaining their trust. When you, when you violate trust, you lose influence. When you come close to people and you uh, show interest in their needs and uh, their dreams, you and help them reach those dreams and achieve those goals, you are creating uh, a bond with those people. You have to be bonded to people to be able to make change. So to move people in a new, new direction, you need influence. Well, there's another myth about leadership that we need to also explore for a moment, and that's the entrepreneurial myth. Frequently, people assume that a salesperson and entrepreneurs are leaders, but that's not always the case. Being an enterprising, innovative, and successful entrepreneur doesn't make a person a leader. People may be buying his products, but that doesn't make him a leader. The best he is able to do is persuade people for a moment, but he holds no long-term influence on them. We could put it in another way by saying, you can sell somebody something, he can be convinced to buy it today, but unless he is really moved with the principle, he's not going to continue to do that tomorrow. You have to keep selling it to him every day. He needs to be sold again every day. But when a person gets an idea, when he gets a principle, a concept, he can then go with that thing, he can run with it, and that will help him in the future to maintain that relationship with that, that product, that idea, that concept. So being a good salesman isn't necessarily leadership. I don't know if you know the story of Abraham Lincoln, where he was um, in the militia. This was some time before the Civil War. And he recruited uh, a whole uh, company of men 
to uh, join the militia. He sold them on the idea of being partisans, of being patriots, and um, so he was put in command of this company. And as he was seeking to drill them and uh, discipline them as a company of um, soldiers, he found that he hadn't any experience doing that. So what happened was, while he was able to sell them on the idea of participating in a militia, he ended up being a simple um, private and marching with the others because others had better influence, had better uh, skills, and more experience in drilling men. So while he was able to sell them the idea, he wasn't able to lead them in the idea. He didn't have the skills, the experience, and the influence to maintain that leadership. So he fell into the, par uh, to the place of being a simple private. Well, uh, fortunately for America, Abraham Lincoln learned how to lead men through those and other experiences. Now, there's another myth about influence or the law of, of uh, influence, and that is knowledge is leadership. Well, knowledge is pay, uh, power, said Francis Bacon. Most people believe power is the essence of leadership and naturally assume that those who possess knowledge and intelligence are leaders. But that isn't automatically true. IQ doesn't necessarily equate to leadership. My son told me that um, he had to struggle in his studies in college and that he wasn't getting uh, the highest grades there. He got good grades, but they weren't the highest in college. He said there were other people who hardly studied at all and got straight A's. But he said one of his professors told him, don't worry, those people who find the theory easy do not end up usually being leaders because they haven't got what it takes to manage other people. They don't understand what other people are going through because they haven't gone through it themselves. They end up being the uh, people who are doing the backroom work and taking care of the theory and the making some applications perhaps, but the people who run the companies, the people who are the leaders, are usually the C and B students, not the A students. Very interesting concept. So when you have to struggle to do something, when you're there in the midst of it and it doesn't necessarily come easy for you, don't think that you can't be a leader. You can be. If everything comes easy with, for, for you, you might be considering the fact that um, you're, because it's so easy for you, you're thinking, why shouldn't it be easy for everyone else? Therefore, you're not going to be able to connect with other people. So don't worry if you have to struggle to get through your studies. That doesn't mean you're not going to be a leader. Those who have to struggle the most often are the best leaders. There's another myth about the law of influence, that those who are the pioneers are the leaders. But this is not necessarily true. Another common misconception is that anyone who is out in front of the crowd is a leader. But being first isn't always the same as leading. To be a leader, a person has to not only be out in front, but also have people intentionally coming behind him, following his lead, and acting on his vision. So you can't necessarily put uh, leadership as being the first. Henry Ford was the first really to manufacture uh, vehicles in an assembly line. And I don't know if you've ever read or studied the story of Henry Ford, but Henry Ford um, uh, almost destroyed his own company because he wanted to control everything. And anybody who came up with an idea um, that wasn't his, he got rid of. And anybody who was trying to be innovative ahead of him, he fired or demoted them. One of his uh, crew of uh, engineers had developed an improvement on the Model T Ford. When they presented it to Henry, he tore it apart, literally, by hand, and destroyed it. Because he didn't think that an automobile uh, needed any improvement. The Model T Ford was good enough. But what happened eventually, of course, is that um, Henry realized that other car companies were producing much cars much better and his Model T Ford, so eventually he had to come around and agree to have the Model A. 
And now we know that's all history. We're still not driving Model A's. Well, in Europe, uh, particularly in uh, Russia, they produced one car for many, many years. And those who bought that car, the Lada, the, under communism, they knew what they were going to get because the Lada never improved. It was just a Lada. And interestingly enough, um, I don't know if you ever heard about that, you had to buy it today and wait 10 years for delivery. That's the efficiency that they had in the Soviet Union. So that was their kind of leadership. Another myth about leadership or influence is that uh, position makes you a leader. This, this is called the position myth. A great misunderstanding uh, that people uh, have about leadership is that they think it is based upon position, but it's not. Stanley Huff said, it's not the position that makes the leader, it's the leader that makes the position. When I travel in the world and handle uh, leadership meetings in Africa particularly, I do not tell people that we have positions in this church. What we have is responsibilities. And if you have done your responsibility well, then perhaps you need to consider giving someone else the opportunity to grow in that position and make room for others to develop. If you've not done it well, you need to move aside and let someone else take that role. So position doesn't make you a leader. And if you will go into any group of people, there is always somebody who is the natural leader. It doesn't matter whether they have the position or not. If you sit in a circle of people and we're talking about doing something or not doing something, watch what happens in that circle of people. There may be one person who is the leader, but he may not be the, the real leader in the group. Because when the real leader speaks, other people follow. And we'll talk about that in another law of leadership. That hap hap happens to be called the law of uh, E. F. Hutton. But the real leader is not always the person who has the position. When you look around the room and that person who is the real leader speaks, then everybody else says, hey, that's a good idea. I think we ought to do that. And everybody gets on board and they go in that direction. So the law of influence, we're talking about a lot about the law of influence because it is such an important law. True leadership is influence. Leadership is the ability to obtain followers. It is the ability to influence others to follow you because without followers, who are you leading? Turn around, looking back at you. Is anybody following? If no one's following, you're not a leader. Medical ministry, pages 64, 164, and 165 says, I am instructed by the Lord to say, the position never gives a man grace or makes him righteous. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Some men entrusted with positions of responsibility entertain the idea that position is for the aggrandizement of self or the exaltation of self. So, Sister White agrees with this principle, that position does not make a man a leader. I remember um, different cases where people just wanted an office because they wanted to have something of importance. They didn't want anything to do, they just wanted a position. Now we read on in the Spirit of Prophecy, in order for a man to become a successful minister, something more than book knowledge is essential. The laborer for soul needs integrity, intelligence, industry, energy, and tact. All these are highly essential for the success of a minister of Christ. No man with these qualities can be inferior, but will have commanding influence. Unless the laborer in God's cause can gain the confidence of those for whom he is laboring, he can do but little good. So we have the word confidence here. Is confidence equated with influence? I think so, quite closely. If you don't have the confidence of people, how can you influence them? How can you gain and grow confidence? Well, she says in another testimony, confidence begets confidence. So when we're showing a distrust, when we're showing that we can't, have confidence in others, 
What are we doing? We're killing our own influence. We're not moving in the positive direction. Of course, we can also have trust and confidence in people and encourage them to do something that is not the best or something wrong even. So we need to be able to encourage people to have confidence, but confidence that God will help them do the right thing. Not that he's going to cover them and just tell them that uh, everything is okay, you're okay, I'm okay mentality. We have to have confidence that God can work from within to bring a change for the benefit of others on the outside. As one other writer has said, private victory uh, precedes public victory. So as we're working to um, be leaders, we need to work on our influence quotient. And how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of ways. One is to be out in front, to be knowledgeable, to be um, consistent, to gain people's confidence by um, acting in trust, and uh, by trusting them and giving them your confidence. So from the law of influence, now we're going to go to the third law of leadership, which is also something that is comforting for us because not all of us are where we would like to be in our leadership abilities. And this is the law of, the, of process. What does that mean, the law of process? Well, leadership develops daily, not in a day. Become, becoming a leader is not like investing um, successfully in the stock market. If you hope to make it in a day, excuse me, a leadership uh, is a lot like investing in the, successfully in the stock market. If you hope to make it in a day, you're, going to, you're not going to be successful. What matters most is that you do day by day over the long haul. In other words, as we take care of our little duties day by day, the little things that we choose to do or choose not to do bring us success or failure. Choosing to take care of the, the things in your, in your influence, in your world, and having order in your life of being where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there. Showing up is one of those rules of process. Being there. Uh, making an influence, making a difference in uh, the class, in uh, the work, in what you're doing. Trying to get your homework done on time and being prepared for the meetings is very important. It's the little things that we can do and cannot do that determine the direction we go. If we do those things, those little things, we will go up in our ability to be leaders. If we don't do those little things, that are easy to do and easy not to do, we will go down over the long haul. And these little things that we do day by day are very telling in the long run. The success of our, the secret of our success is found in our daily agenda. If you continually invest in your leadership development, letting your assets compound, the inevitable result is growth over time. I just read a statistic recently, that if you are 22 years old and you begin investing $2,000 a month, uh, no, $2,000 a year in a savings account that earns reasonable interest, I don't know what the interest rate was, or in some kind of thing that would give you interest of a reasonable amount. Uh, of course, savings accounts won't do that today. You'd have to invest it in something else. But if you would invest $2,000 a year for seven years, by the time you're 29, um, you would have invested $14,000. If you let that compound over time, you will have a million dollars by the time you're 65. But if you wait till you're 69 to start investing $2,000 a month, you will have to invest till you're 57 years old. In other words, you will have to invest how much, how much, how much more money? Let's say 50, uh, 59, 
you'll have to invest, instead of seven years, you will have to wait 30 years or 28 years, four times as much. If you wait till you're 29 to start investing, that same money will not, it will take you almost 30 years to come to a million dollars in the same effect. So as you build early in your experience, the little things you do at the beginning don't seem like very much. But what happens at near the end? They compound. So as you take care of the little things that don't seem so important, the little things that you can do or not do, if you don't do them, you're not investing. You're taking your de you're, um, withdrawing from your influence and from your process, from the progress you need to make. But if you do the things day by day, the little things that make a difference, like being always ready, being uh, prepared, those things add up in the long run and make a huge difference. For instance, if I were to give you a million dollars or give you a choice today between a million dollars and a penny, and I told you that the penny would compound or would double every day for 30 days, which would you rather have, the million dollars or the penny? Because the penny is going to be worth $10 million in 30 days by compounding. And that's what it means, the process. The process means to take care of the little things. If that's not yours, don't take it. And if you use it up, make sure you replace it. If you fill it up, empty it. So taking care of the little things day by day tell the difference in the long run. It's like that compounding that penny. That's what makes a difference in your development. So the law of process. We have a lesson here also from some other people who talk about this process. In a study of 90 top leaders from a variety of fields, leadership expert Warren Bennis and Bert Nannis made a discovery about the relationship between growth and leadership. They said, it is the capacity to develop and improve their skills that distinguish leaders from their followers. Successful leaders are learners, and that learning process is an ongoing result of self-discipline and perseverance. The goal each day must be to get a little better, to build on, previous, on the previous day's progress. Any man who says, you have to accept me as I am, is not a leader. You have to take me for what I am, and that's all you're going to get, is not a leader. So unless you're willing to improve, you are not a leader. How can you lead others if you're not willing to improve? How can you ask others to make changes when you are not willing to be changed? How can you ask others to repent and to confess if you are not willing to repent and confess? There's a, there's a sign, there's a board, uh, a plaque outside of one of the, um, I think the Congress in the United States um, capital of Washington. It says something to the effect, now I've never seen it, somebody just told me about it. It says, the man who admits he is wrong is wiser today than he was yesterday. And that's the law of process. I know uh, one man who led his uh, granddaughter off at school, first day of school, and he said to her, I wish you all the success, honey. Go get him. He was saying to himself inside, I hope you fail a lot. Because it's by failure that we make our greatest learning experiences. To try and to fail is much better than to have never tried at all. It's another saying. So when we look at the principles of the, of the Ten Commandments, do you remember the third principle of the, of, of the laws of success, which we talked about uh, some months ago? Do you remember the third one? What's the first one? Do you remember? I already mentioned it here. First law of the universe is order. What's the second? Remember? God breathes in his nostrils 
He formed man of dust of the ground. He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. So what is the second thing? After order comes life. What comes after life? Every living thing must grow or die. Are you growing? If you're not growing, you are, you're dead. What is the eighth law of the universe? Do you remember? It has to do with thou shalt not steal. The principle behind that is excellence, is it not? Quality. When you do your very best, what happens? You get better at it, don't you? Some of you are practicing the violin now. How can you get better if you don't practice? Impossible. Impossible. So you have to practice and you have to do the best you can. Do you, do you think a violinist or a pianist ever comes to the point where they say, oh, I'm good enough, I'm not going to practice anymore? No. I mean, a true a performer would never do that. The performers who are really the great ones, when they get through with a concert, you know what they do when everybody else has left the hall? They go back and play the piece again and make sure they don't make the mistake they made during the concert. They play it all over again and they make sure they do it right. They're always improving. They're always making it better. So they're growing by doing their very best. So if we're not doing our very best every day, what are we doing? We are stealing from ourselves, we're stealing from our brothers and sisters, and we're definitely stealing from God. Because he's made an investment in us. It's a process. No matter where you are in this process, it doesn't matter. But what matters is that it's daily self-discipline and perseverance that makes for true improvement. Amen? Amen? So unless you're dedicated to the law of process, you are not a leader. If you're not yourself improving, if things go by day by day by day, and they're always the same, are you, are you improving? Forgive me for mentioning a uh, modern uh, parable. There's a modern parable that comes out of a movie called um, Groundhog Day. I don't know if you've heard about this movie. I heard about it. I found it very interesting. This man wakes up every day. It's the same day over and over again. At first, he uh, gets very spiteful, very hateful, and uh, I won't tell you what he tries to do. But he eventually realizes that no matter what he does, he's going to wake up the next day. It's going to be the same day all over again. So what he does, he changes his attitude. He changes his mind. And he saves the boy that's going to die falling out of a tree. He helps the ladies, old ladies on their way to some gathering that have a flat tire. And he goes to music class every day. Sets the little girl outside the store or the door and takes the music lesson. And he improves his ability until he can play the piano uh, beautifully and perfectly. And he respects others and doesn't take advantage of anyone. And he finally lives the perfect day and he wakes up the next day. So it's a modern parable for us that we're here and we're living the same day, the same routine over and over again. And we're always late. We're always missing this. We have forgotten that. And we get a next day to practice, to get up on time, to make sure we say our prayers, to have that time where we're reading 10 pages of the spirit of prophecy in our Bibles. And so every day is a practice for what's gone on before. And when are we going to leave this world? When are we going to be ready to leave this world, I should say? Right? Every day is an opportunity to grow in that process. And if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we are not growing. We're falling behind. I've often said, stop the world. I need six months to catch up. Maybe a year, please. Just stop everything, and then I can get caught up with everything. But the truth is, it's a lifestyle. It's our lifestyle. We take on more than we can carry, and we wonder why things are the way they are. We have something also in the spirit of prophecy from Review and Herald of 1892, which says, the work to which Christ calls us is, to, is the work of progressive conquest over spiritual evil in our characters. Natural tendencies are to be overcome. Appetite and passion 
must be conquered and the will must be placed wholly on the side of Christ. So when we talk about this process, it's a process by which we need to yield to God, yield to his ways. Every single day is a time of process, is a time to practice. And as we've said, only perfect practice makes perfect. So we have another thought here under the law of process that it, again, she emphasizes a progressive conquest over spiritual and natural tendencies. Appetite is what God has given us, the right arm of the message, the entering wedge of the message, and the strength of the message is to become self-controlled. Add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance. So there we have it. Temperance is where we begin conquering self. Now the law of process has four basic, uh, has been described in four basic growth phases. Phase one is I don't know what I don't know. In other words, you don't know anything. You think you know, but you really don't. But when you begin to realize that you don't know what you don't know, then you begin to realize that there's something you do need to know. Then you come to the point in second phase, I know what I don't know. Is that important to come to a point where you know what you don't know? I think it is. It's a very difficult leap, in fact. Many people are confident and satisfied at where they are. They're not interested in growing. They don't even know what they don't know. And if anybody tries to tell them, they become their enemy. But when people try to help us, then we begin to know and understand what we don't know. Then, but phase three, I grow and I know, and it starts to show. And phase four, it becomes natural. I simply go because I, of what I know. So confidence born of trust advances in experience. Signs of the Times, November 3rd, 1890. So where does our confidence come from? Our knowledge. But true knowledge is a knowledge of experience, of actually experiencing the thing. I, how many times I've heard people say to the effect, I have it here, which means they know the theory, but where, how can I get it here? Have you ever felt that? I know it in theory, but it just doesn't come out in my life. It's not showing in my life. Well, how, what's the distance from here to here? 18 inches. Or less. You know? You figure the, about, about 18 inches, yeah. About the time it takes uh, light to travel a nanosecond. A billionth of a second. And yet we have it here, but we don't have it here. And the reason we don't have it here is because here is experience. Here is theory. Unless we live the theory, it will never become here, the experience. We have to live it in order to experience it. And once we live it, we know it. And that's something that only shows. You can't really tell it. You can't give it to someone else. You can't give the experience of living the knowledge to someone else. And that's why the five wise virgins couldn't give the oil to the five foolish virgins. I, would, I always thought, or thought in the past, how come these people who are Christians, the five wise virgins, wouldn't be willing to share their oil with their, brother, with their sisters? Is that the Christian thing to do? To hoard it for yourself? No, it's not. But it's not something you can give to someone else. It's something you must experience by living what you know. That's why the five wise virgins couldn't give it to the five foolish virgins. And if we haven't lived it by the time the Lord is ready to come, what's going to be for us? We're not going to have time, are we, to live it? When we come back and knock on the door, it's going to be too late. So the law of process is born out of trust. Trust who? Confidence is born of trust. Who must we trust? We must learn to trust the Lord. We also must trust our brothers and sisters to the Lord. We must believe that God will lead them also as he has led us. So confidence born of trust 
advances in experience. What does the Apostle Paul say in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 3? What does he say there? Let's open our Bibles there, please. Let's look at that text at this point. Romans chapter 5. And not only so, he talks about um, we have access by faith to the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of God in verse 2. And not only so, we glory also in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed in our, broad, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So what is in the middle of all this? Experience. Where does experience come from? By being patient. What does patience mean? You've learned that in your seminar. What does patience mean? Remaining under, right? Being willing to accept what God has led, uh, given us, uh, led us to experience. And tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. So this is the process. So this is why it talks about the law, uh, the, the Peter's ladder, that we need to be climbing that ladder, faith, uh, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. That ladder which we are growing on. So once we come to this idea that we've, we have each moment, each day, to improve, to grow, to experience the presence of God, we need to realize that there is something else happening in our lives. God wants us to make these experiences, and in order to grow in this trust, we must come to the confidence that God is leading us, that he is the one who knows where we need to go. And so we come to the fourth law of leadership. That fourth law is called the law of navigation. The law of navigation. Anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. Now, when we have given our lives to the Lord, we have a leader, we have a helmsman in our personal experience, and that helmsman is Jesus Christ. And we have confidence now that he is leading us, and we can trust in him. We don't have to question his leadership. But he is leading us also to be a leader for other, others. Leroy Ems, a very famous author on leadership, says uh, in his uh, book, uh, Be the Leader You Were Meant to Be, writes this, A leader is one who sees more than others sees, who sees farther than others sees, and who sees before others see. In order to be a successful leader, you must learn the importance of the law of navigation and be willing to navigate the course for your followers. I read something recently by Gandhi. Where was that? Um, I can't remember where I saw it. It was, I think, in somebody's email. They put it at the bottom of their email. Maybe it was one of you, even. Um, Gandhi said, at first they mock you, then they laugh at you, then they go to war with you, and then you win. So when you're a leader, you have to step out in front of other people's ideas. And they sometimes, as it says in different places, they throw you under the bus. Because they can't agree, they can't understand, they don't see where you're going. But you must, in order to be a leader, you must be willing to stand for principle. If God is leading, you must be willing to stand for the truth. And you must be able to do it with the confidence in God. Who can you think of um, right now, we've studied many different individuals in our seminar here, who have taken the lead, who have stood out in front of the crowd and been condemned and misunderstood by many others, but in the end were proven correct? Who can you think of? Can you think of anyone? Joe. Joe, okay. He was also in a certain circumstance. What about, I'm talking more about now of people who were leaders, who were not well followed at first. Moses, yes. Moses definitely. He was in the wilderness, didn't think he could lead the people, went back and they even weren't sure, but God uh, provided 
for him to be an, a person of influence and through his confidence in God uh, actually led the people. Who else can you think of who was a great leader? Joshua, exactly. Very important leader. How about David? A fugitive. Went to, leadership went to make war with him. He's a perfect example. What about Jeremiah? You know, he didn't have a lot of followers in his day, but he wrote down what he had, and afterwards he made a difference in Israel through his writing. Ezra and Nehemiah. Christ himself, of course, who was um, benign, uh, denied by his own house and his own people and rejected in the people of Nazareth and by his own nation. And yet, eventually, um, he proved to be uh, quite, um, well, an influence on the whole world. Well, so the law of navigation. Navigators draw on the past, their past experiences. They know what has happened, and that applies again uh, as we look back to the law of process. They know how God has led in the past. Navigators listen to what others have to say. Navigators uh, examine the conditions before making comments. What did Nehemiah do? He took his donkey and rode around the, rode around the city at night looking and making an assessment of the situation. What did Joseph do before he went into to Pharaoh. It's rumored in the Talmud and so forth that he actually examined the records of the Nile. He knew the, the history of the Nile. He knew different things about Egypt before he made his comments. He, was, he learned from past experience. So how often we make uh, these uh, quick judgments, and I'm, I can't say that I'm not guilty also of shooting and asking questions later. That's the American motto, shoot first and ask questions later. But we need to learn to ask questions. And how many times we can get ourselves um, the information we need or get ourselves in trouble if we don't. So navigators examine the conditions before making comments. Navigators make sure their conclusions represent both faith and fact. So we need to act on faith, but we can't ignore the facts as well. So the law of navigation. What is a leader? Leader is someone who draws on past experiences. Yes, but a leader is someone who knows how to chart the course. Not somebody who can just tail the boat, who can read the direction you need to go. He's someone who knows where we're going, who climbs the highest tree in the forest and says, ah, that's where we're going. That's the place we need to be. And draws people together to get them in that position, to get them in that place. So let's summarize what we've studied before we take our break. Can you remember what we talked about? What is the first law of leadership? It's called the law of the lid. What does it mean? People will rise no higher than their minister or their leader. That's right. So if you want people to rise higher, what do you need to exemplify? True daily conversion. Amen? Amen. True character. Absolute integrity. Simple honesty. And a true confidence in other people. What is the second law that we looked at? The law of influence. Can you do anything without influence? How can you destroy your influence? By putting other people and other things down. By breaking, their trust as well. By breaking trust. We'll talk more about that as well. But influence. Influence is the currency of leadership. You want more influence, you need to have self-discipline. And you have to have, be willing to open yourself and to other people. You need to come close to other people. You need to be able to bond with other people. And doing things together is very important in that bonding process. What is the third law of leadership? The law of process. You don't have to be satisfied where you're at. You, if you're a, even if you're a one in leadership, you can grow in leadership. You can become a two, a three, or a four, or a five, maybe even an eight in leadership. You can become what you behold. 
And the greatest leader of all times was Jesus Christ. And what is the fourth law of leadership? Leadership, leaders know where we want to go. Not just how we're going to get there. That's management. But leaders see the goal, and that's where they go. And they get other people on board for that. So I hope this has been helpful for you, that you can understand a little bit more about why it's important that we uh, have self-discipline in our lives. Why we're willing to be converted daily, be overcomers in little things, doing the little things that are hard, they're easy not to do, but are also easy to do. Those things make the difference between someone who's growing and somebody who isn't growing. May the Lord help us to be people of excellence, people who grow, who make a difference in our own lives every day and cause others to be followers of Jesus Christ through our example. May God help us. Amen.